I, I read the last two pages again last night just to make sure. Because uh, we're talking about the Christology as, as comparing Paul and John. And what our author Golder is talking about, I'll just read some of this stuff and then we can kind of go from there. The, vis the visiting preachers are leading you astray from your sincere and pure devotion. Just like Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, preaching a Jesus other than the Jesus we preach. And I put in parentheses, Jesus was human. That's the big distinction between the Patrines and the Paulines. This is Paul saying to his people in Corinthians, um, don't listen to those visiting preachers who are saying to you that Jesus was human. And, you know, remember, the possessionist is human until he was until the dove landed on him and he was baptized by the spirit. So that was the big distinction in there. And then also what he preached in Corinthians was receiving a different spirit from the spirit you received. And if you remember way back in the first couple of chapters, we talked about how the patrines um, had these, these visions and tongues and people would just kind of do crazy stuff and not necessarily have any particular reason for it and what the Paulines were saying was there has to be something from the spirit of Christ for those tongues and visions to have any purpose not just anything goes like the Patrines were doing and then finally um, that he was talking about a different gospel from the one that you accepted and so we're talking to the Jerusalem Jews and, and, and remember the Patrines are keeping the law and that's keeping the Jewish laws. And Paul is saying that the Jesus laws go beyond that. You don't have to just go, you know, follow everything that the old Jewish laws were saying. So it's kind of a, it, it's kind of him uh, saying to these people that he's talking to, don't listen to the Jerusalem Jews. <laughs> so, all right. And then, and then uh, he kind of goes on on what, what the gifts of the spirit mean. And um, if you look down, like in the last sentence, it, it's interesting that in 1 Corinthians, he talks about them. I want you to know that there's no one who is speaking by the spirit of God who says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So the way that Golder was describing this, and I honestly don't see anything in the Bible where somebody says Jesus is cursed. I mean, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but Paul is saying to his people, if they say Jesus is cursed, then it's not from Jesus be cursed. Yeah, true. Jesus be cursed. Yeah, there's there's all kinds of ways of saying that though. I mean, I think what what Golder is explaining is that if there are some of the patrines are saying that that uh, we've gone too far by saying that Jesus is Christ. You know, because the Patrines didn't consider him Christ. They considered him human, who was Christ for a while until the spirit left him when he died. And so, at least according to Boulder, that's the distinction that he's talking about. Does everybody agree with my interpretation of what Boulder is saying here? Because I don't think there's anything in the Bible that says Jesus be cursed. Well, I think it's more from that second sentence. <clears throat> You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to meet idols. Right. And so I think that's more, you know, the pagan thing saying, you know, cursing Jesus, Jesus be cursed, is totally different than Jesus yeah. is cursed. Because that's interesting. That is actually how I've always <clears throat> looked at that scripture. You know, that I've always looked at Paul and even other things in the Bible we're really comparing Christianity to the pagans, which is what the first half of this scripture says. You're absolutely correct. But Golder is telling us that it, he's talking to the, the people in Corinth who are listening to the Patrine. So it, it's, the, it's the, those Jerusalem Jews who don't believe that Jesus is Christ. I, I don't know if Golder is correct or not, to be honest with you. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing that this Jesus because part has something to do with <clears throat> Jewish tradition about uncleanliness. <clears throat> so yeah. if the belief was that 
uh, Jesus died in a state of crucifixion mm -hmm. and that's the spirit that Christ had left him, if that's what the Petrians believed, then that leaves Jesus dying in a state of sin or uncleanness. Oh. And so this cursing is probably not, I'm just, again, I'm just making this up as I go along here. This cursing <laughs> is probably not like we would say to somebody, you know, the heck with you or whatever. Oh. It's more Jesus is cursed because he accepted the sins on himself and then the Christ left and here's here's the empty shell with all the sin. Kind of kind of the scapegoat thing. That's okay. you know that's where scapegoating came from was, was Judaism. So that would that would make sense then if Paul if if Golder at least is saying that. So so in, in, in Jewish law there are so many things that make one unclean and if you're unclean you're kind of in a cursed state and the Petrines believed that at the moment of death or just prior to his death, the, the Christ left Jesus' body, left his human body behind. And, and Jesus died on the cross, but not the Christ. And so if Jesus died, that kind of a punishment, that would be considered an unclean event in Judaism. These were Jewish Christians. So they would have said Jesus was cursed in, in the flesh. Okay, Jesus, the man, was cursed. And, and I, again, I think we're, maybe we're interpreting it from our viewpoint that we're saying, you know, damn, damn you, Jesus, or whatever. And that's not yeah. probably what they were saying. That's what they're saying. saying. Okay. This is, that makes this more is sense Jesus, to me. This is how Jesus ended up. Yeah, I was taking it yeah. literally. Yeah. It's like, it didn't make any sense. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, that's why I think it's maybe important okay. to look at. Yeah. That makes, yeah, that makes more sense with what the, you know, the previous slide said, too. It's like, that makes more sense in terms of the human laws, you know, the, the Jewish laws versus God's law. So. Well, there's another angle to it too. Remember that in Corinth and other locations, there were uh, missionaries coming in from Jerusalem, uh, often speaking under the spirit. And they may very well have been saying such things as you are required to get circumcised. You are required to honor the Sabbath. Jesus be damned, you know, and uh, so I think uh, Golder refers to that earlier. So I think he may okay. actually be referring to some of those visiting yeah. missionaries who were more. So maybe they were saying the heck with Jesus. Yeah, yeah. I, I think okay, so. Well, I think they may be. Yeah. Yeah. That's when I'm not sure what Golder's talking yeah. about. <laughs> well, and, <laughs> and to be honest, we're not sure what the Bible is. The right. Yeah, well, about, I mean, because true. He's, yeah, we're looking at the scripture now thinking, huh, oh, I don't yeah, know what they meant. Yeah. Well, and, and Golder makes the point that often uh, in the, the New Testament writers are reacting to something that we don't know has happened. And so we're getting one half of the conversation and we don't know what the other half is. Right. Well, then sometimes Golder thinks we know what he's talking about. And don't always yes, that's, true. that's right. He, right. He, is, he is quite a few leagues ahead of us yeah. there. So, yeah. okay. So this is basically the same thing. This is in John. Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. This is how you rec recognize the spirit. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But if you don't, if does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God, this is the spirit of the Antichrist. So we go into the, you know, the opposing viewpoint thing. If, if once again, they're he's talking about the Petrine saying that Jesus was not God until he was not the Christ until the Christ landed on him from the dove. Yeah, it's kind of a crude way to say it, but that's that's what I keep getting from all of this. I wonder what he would think about it. Okay, I think it's one more. And this is how you test the spirits. Jesus is Lord. Jesus has come in the flesh. That's Pauline. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. So that's when I that's when I asked the question. <laughs> what is for change saying Jesus be cursed? Um, and so Boulder is saying that the possession is theology started in the 50s, which is actually before Paul, right? Yeah, so that was Mark. 40s and 50s. Okay, so we're going to go into Mark next, so that kind of gets you right there where you need to be. Okay, so 
now we're on chapter 18. There you go. And uh, all we're going to. It's all about Mark now. We're going to be possessed one more Sunday. <laughs> uh, he's talking about before Mark, and the premise is that Mark again is responding to a situation that existed before he wrote the book of Mark, which would put us back in the 50s and 60s. That year. So, so I hope this makes sense as we go through. Um, first of all, he starts off talking about, you know, who, who was Jesus? And in Mark, it says, Jesus and his disciples went on the, onto the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. So um, Golder is saying that Mark is responding to a common premise uh, or um, the gossip about Jesus in this time period and saying uh, through the disciples. They say you're John the Baptist. They're saying you're Elijah. And he said, then Christ says, but what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Okay, so by reverse inference, uh, Golder is saying there was this common belief that maybe Jesus was uh, Elijah, etc. Gospel of Mark con contradicts the Jewish Christian Petrine views twice about Jesus, the one that we just read, uh, and basically says Jesus was not John the Baptist, Elijah, or one of the prophets. And that, again, is the Pauline view, kind of the anti-possessionist view, which means it would be the Petrine view, or the, the view of the followers of Peter or the jurors of the church. The second place is where King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said he is Elijah, and still others claimed he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. So again, <clears throat> twice Mark is referring to this common belief. Was that Mark or John? That was Mark. Oh, okay. That's, that's you're, Mark. You're my John. Um, 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 um. I got Mark and John mixed up. Because <laughs> <laughs> if, and later on, you'll see a scripture where basically um, it talks about the disciples going, Peter going to the home of the mother of John, also known as Mark. Oh, no. So just to keep things <laughs> true, <terrific, laughs> even more confused. So I do remember that. Okay, so why the comparison with Elijah? Anybody care to venture? I know the story that Golder talked about, I think, was that um, in the history of Elijah and Elisha, Elisha was the follower of, of Elijah, or the, the one who received his mantle when he went on. Okay. And supposedly Elisha was blessed with twice the power or twice the spirit that Elijah was. And so they kind of equated that to John the Baptist and Jesus. And Jesus was two times John the Baptist. Okay. Now, remember that two times when we get to talk a little bit more about well, Elijah and, and Elisha. And the other comparison is because Elijah did so many miracles. Yes. Like Jesus did. Yes. You know, the raising the rising of the dead. Yep. Old Testament, Elijah had, was taken to heaven and his mantle fell on the late Elijah. Okay. So there's a, this passing of the mantle, of the hand of God, uh, whatever you want to call it. And remember, we talked about the two times. Well, um, aside from Moses, the great miracle workers were Elijah and Elisha. And there are 83 miracles recorded in the Old Testament. 16 are Elisha, Elijah's and 32 are Elisha's. I'm not great with math, but I think that's two times. Double. Yeah, that's, that's double. So, so did you count all those? Yeah, Can I count all that, those? Yeah. I, I rely on uh, some other researchers <laughs> who are far more knowledgeable than I am. So. Well, what's interesting, too, is that the uh, the number of miracles that Elijah uh, performed 
Some put it as low as six. Some indicate that the prophecies were not miracles. So, you know, it, it goes back and forth. Okay, John the Baptist, uh, the comparison is, again, because John the Baptist thought by some Christians to be Elijah returned from heaven. So the mantle of Elijah and Elisha rested upon John the Baptist. Elijah and Elisha were ordinary human beings, prophets, and the spirit of the Lord. Another version say the hand of the Lord. Another version, version say the mantle of the Lord uh, fell on them and enable miraculous events. Okay. So again, you, you've seen the, the comparison. And <laughs> keep in mind, Golders trying to make a point between the Patrines and the Paulines. And the Patrines are the church in Jerusalem. He says, uh, based on all that we've read in this book, uh, believe that Jesus had, Jesus was the Christ from baptism to his crucifixion, okay? Not before, not after. So Jesus was a vessel for uh, the mantle, the spirit of God, etc. cetera. Uh, now, what we believe and what they believe may be two different things. So, so the book of John actually took that story that, that you just read from the book, book of Mark and it, John really expanded it, that conversation between Peter and Jesus. No. And perhaps this is why, well, to make it even clearer. Okay. Yeah, you know, who do you say uh, that I am? That's yes. a big thing in, yes. in between Peter and Jesus. Yes. I've, right. I've heard a lot in sermons. <laughs> yeah. The other comparisons were that both were messengers. Um, Elijah in 2 Kings uh, 2, 2 and 2 4 and 2 6 basically says to Elisha, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. And then later he says, sent me to Jericho. And later said, sent me to Jordan. And of course, each time Elisha says, basically like Ruth, where you go, I will go. Mm -hmm. uh, so he, he doesn't obey <laughs> Elijah. <laughs> um, also, Malachi says, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. And of course, that reference is also made of John the Baptist, Mark uh, 1, 2. So, continu continuing the comparison, both uh, Elijah and uh, John the Baptist faced weak kings, Ahab and Herod, and strong kings, or queens, uh, Jezebel and uh, Herodias. Rodius, exactly. Um, so again, he's making this comparison that there is a reason why they believe that the mantle fell on John the Baptist and later was passed on to Jesus. Both had a garment of hair and had a leather belt around his waist. Well, that was Elijah, and John was clothed in camel hair. Now, depending on the version of the Bible you look. He wasn't clothed in camel hair, he was hairy. So, <laughs> so take, take your pick, but Golders using the interpretation that he was clothed in, in camel hair. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, we're talking about John the Baptist versus Elijah. Well, Golder makes the comment that there was a Jerusalem gospel before Mark. And he doesn't equated with the Gospel of Hugh. We've talked about the Gospel of Hugh before, but you know, there are portions of Matthew Mark that are very similar, and some scholars claim that there was this Gospel of Hugh, which is no longer existent, and that, uh, you know, it, it was in circulation before, before Mark. No, I thought the Gospel of Hugh was just the same as Gospel of Mark, but a narrative. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, that's what we think. But since um, I don't have that Gospel of Pew on my bookshelf, I, I don't really know exactly what it was. But generally, you're right. It, oh, I see it's the sayings. I have a copy. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to borrow what from you someday. Is, not, not the original. Yeah. 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 You've got the Gospel of <laughs> You've been holding out on us. <laughs>
Mark was, the, the claim of Boulder is that Mark was influenced by the stories told in uh, his mother's home by Peter. Uh, and so he talks about an early, he implies an early Petrini influence on Mark. And that becomes obvious a little bit more as we talk about the rest of this chapter. Uh, the Gospel of Mark features only leaders of the early church in Jerusalem, Peter, James, and John, which is another reason why he, he claims, Boulder claims, that uh, there was an early Petrine influence in the stories that, that Mark told. And that comes from the escape from Peter from prison. Peter followed him, and I, I really abbreviated this down so I could get it on one slide, because I know you don't want to read 10 point type on the screen. But, um, following, uh, Peter followed him, the angel, out of the prison. He thought he was seeing a vision. He went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark. There's our confusion. <laughs> where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance and a servant, Rhoda was her name, by the way, came to, the, to answer the door. She was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. <laughs> <laughs> so she slams the door in his face, goes back to tell everybody he's there. You're out of your mind, they told her, when she kept insisting that it was so. They said, it must be his angel. Of course, mm -hmm. Peter continues knocking eventually, but they let him in. So actually, there's a grammatical problem there, too. Was Mary called Mark, or was John called Mark? <laughs> Mary the mother of John. The house of Mary the mother of John also called Mark. So who is Mark referring to? <laughs> I'm sorry, I've graded too many papers. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Watching for things like that. Um, <laughs> just keep on, I did not write this. <laughs> so I, I used to know a Catholic nun whose name was Mary Mark, and now I know why. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. Golder then compares the Markan outline, the Ebionite outline of, of the Gospels and what, what they believe. Why does he do that? So he says Mark took the Ebionite Gospel and it was basically modified. Okay, and why else? Who, who the heck are the Ebionites? Why, why would... Well, that's uh, subsequent Jerusalem church after the temple. Yeah. Yeah, he's saying that the Jerusalem mission, the, the Petrines, were the basis for the Edenite church. Specifically for the Yes, man. yes, right. <coughs> and they were not exactly the same. They were vegetarians. You know, there are some things that were dissimilar. But Golder is saying that they were the, uh, the ancestors of the Jerusalem church. So... Mark has no birth story. The gospel starts with John the Baptist's teachings. Uh, the power of miracles entered Jesus at baptism, and the spirit leaves at crucifixion. Uh, that's, that's Mark. And we'll come back to that last one. So, TV night, no birth story. The gospel starts with John the Baptist's uh, teachings. The power of miracles enters Jesus at baptism. Christ's spirit leaves at crucifixion. So it's pretty close. Okay. Comments so far? Well, Mark's supposed to be a Pauline. That's right. Well, he was confused. Well, <laughs> Golder says made a few slips. I know. I, I saw that too. It's like, you know, that was just a, a little problem that Mark had in his writing or something. And I was like, yeah. Or it was a problem that Golder had in trying to separate these two missions and have them be distinctive uh, either way. Yeah. So. I mean, he puts a Golder puts a big emphasis on Mark says into the spirit descends as the dove into Jesus, whereas Matthew and mm -hmm. Luke say onto. Yeah. Well, Mark being the first writer after the two, he had to assemble. Writings or remembrance of the few, and he was the first one to kind of put it into a story form. Yeah. And then the others had more time to think about it. I mean, it's Mark may have not thought through all of the theology, I yeah, guess. all the implications of that. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So then Golder compares John the Baptist to Elijah, Elisha. 
John the Baptist, uh, John baptized at uh, Jordan, spirit descends on Jesus. Christ goes into the desert for 40 days. Jesus returns and summons disciples and tells one of the disciples, there's no time to bury your, your dead. You must follow me now. Yeah. Elijah, or Elijah asked Elijah for the gift of his spirit at the Jordan. Elijah flees into the desert and fed by an angel for 40 days. Now keep in mind, that's the second time he flees, flees into the desert, though. but this particular one coincides uh, with Boulder, at least, at the 40 days that Christ spent. Elijah returns and calls Elisha his disciple. No time to kiss his father goodbye. Okay. Um, so you can accept those parallels or not. I mean, they're, you know, I found it fascinating that these, there were some of these were fairly subtle, mm -hmm. like um, that last one talking about no time. And Jesus says, no one has it said, looking back, you know, has his hand on the plow. Mm -hmm. And more or less, that's what yeah. um, yeah. Elijah and Elisha take yeah. place. You come now, uh, disciples are to follow now. Yeah. Don't put your Business right. in order. Don't say goodbye to your family. Come now. Now we warn people not to do that. It might be a scam. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. That's right. This class is great for one liner. <laughs> so, okay, Golder then compares Jesus the Christ and Elisha. Uh, Jesus cleanses the leper. That's in Mark. Jesus raises a 12-year-old daughter of uh, Jairus. Jesus feeds 5,000 in Mark 6. Elisha cleanses a leper in uh, the Second Kings 5th chapter. Elisha raises the dead son of uh, Shunem uh, in Second Kings. Elisha tells his servant to feed a crowd of 500 with, or 100 with uh, 20 loaves. Uh, both seem fairly miraculous as far as feeding the crowds. So. Comments? The parallels are like, Now, there are, and the one comment I would make is keep in mind that the New Testament writers are, are especially trying, many of them, Matthew being one, Luke being another, are especially trying to draw parallels between the Old Testament, what was prophesied, what occurred, and Jesus and his life, and what was prophesied by him. So it may or may not be unusual that there are parallel events here. Uh, or it, it could be, I mean, Paul Bennett drove down 435. I drove down 435. I'm not sure there's any spiritual significance to that. So some of these may simply be boulder grabbing at straws, you know. There is spiritual significance because you both came to Sunday school. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't take 435 at Sunday school. <laughs> yeah, but what if you both drove down 435 backwards with your eyes blinded and you both got here safely? Now but that would be a miracle. <laughs> okay. Is John the Baptist Elijah? Elijah, Elijah, Elisha's stories had influence on the traditions of Jesus. That's what Golder is saying. There was an influence there. Mark says Elijah has come in John the Baptist, uh, and that's in Mark ninth chapter. And that that would tend to put him in the patrine. <clears throat> and here's the, the Thing. Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come, and they have done to him everything they wished, just as it is written about him. Now, what's the thing that they had done to him? <clears throat> Elijah is, uh, is in, in John the Baptist. What do they do to John the Baptist? Oh, yeah, he was beheaded. Well, the story of Elijah didn't go quite so far, but he 
it was another situation where the king thought, I'll just leave him alone, but the king's wife wanted, wanted right. to execute executed right. or done away with. Exactly. They didn't quite get it done, but then John the Baptist comes along. Yeah. And the same thing happened with the Herod and his wife. Yeah. And we've talked about Elijah running from uh, Jezebel and going up into the mountain, the wind coming by. We've talked about that in, in previous classes and all. So. Uh, the mantle was passed from John to Jesus. <clears throat> the old Jerusalem gospel, whatever that may be, it's not, <coughs> excuse me, not Mark. It may be Q. Mm -hmm. uh, saw Jesus as John the Baptist's successor. Some of John's followers became Jesus followers. Again, we're talking about this mantle being passed. Uh, and in some ways it makes sense. You know, John, when he was in prison, Jesus then took over. In fact, here from Mark 1, at once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Uh, repent and believe the good news. And of course, John's famous thing is, kingdom of God is at hand, you know, he was, he was a messenger of four colors. Yes. Well, I was just going to say on the first point, I found it interesting. Of course, we've always read the New Testament where, I don't know which gospel it is, but the, uh, a couple of, or some of John's disciples go to Jesus and say, uh, are you the one we're told? And Jesus says, well, you go back and tell John that you see these things happening. Which suggests that then they don't say what happened to John's followers, but in Wikipedia, <laughs> John's followers continued. Some of John's followers continued to be believe that John the Baptist and him well into the second century. So they didn't all follow Jesus. Yeah. So I'm not sure what that says about um, that that uh, scripture in the New Testament. John's followers asking, who are you? Because they evidently, some of them didn't accept it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Other comments? Okay. Golda writes that Malachi had prophesied that Elijah would come to warn of judgment day, and John was understood to be Elijah returning. When he was executed and judgment day did not come, <coughs> Jesus was seen as the new Elijah. Remember, Elijah first, Elisha second, John first, Jesus second. It was the Pauline movement which elevated Jesus to divine status and depressed, downgraded John. That John being John the Baptist. Now that's older writing. Take it for what it's worth, but that's his, his view. But he continues, by John's gospel, he, John the Baptist, is Elijah no more nor the prophet. He is just a voice crying in the wilderness. So you're talking about the transition from Mark to Matthew and ultimately to the book of John, the Gospel of John. <coughs> Who is the prophet? The nations will dis dispossess. The nations you will dispossess. Listen to those <laughs> who practice sorcery or divination. But God has not permitted you to do so. Lord, your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to, heed him, for this is what you ask of the Lord your God. And that's from Deuteronomy. Now, the significance here is they're trying to determine, okay, who, who is the, the prophet and who is like me? Who's talking? Moses. Moses. Yeah, Moses is talking. And so he's saying that God will raise up a prophet like me from among you. And it goes on in different versions say, you must listen to him. And other versions say, you must heed him. So on the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter, Paul, and John, the three disciples were there with, with Jesus. This is my son whom I, whom I love. Listen to him. And other versions say, listen, heed him. Okay, so... There's a, again, there's a parallel there. So is Jesus the prophet? Well, or is Jesus only a prophet? I don't think they knew. They weren't sure. 
if you read Acts, um, I don't know, about the second chapter, Peter's when he's speaking at Pentecost to the crowd, he says, well, this man, he killed this man, he was the author of lies, he was Messiah, he was the prophet foretold by Moses, mm-hmm. several titles, I don't think they, at that point, had it settled, it was left open a lot of possibilities. Yeah. Who did, who did the Old Testament rabbis say Moses was talking about? Because they would not have said he was talking about this. Um, I, I, my guess is it, it might, it could be, it could be Isaiah. I, I'm not sure, to be honest. I'm not sure who. I don't know. I, I thought yeah. maybe Gold or said I must have No, I'm, I don't think he, he says, and I didn't research that one further. So. Just, you know, typically there's some, there's some other interpretation. Right. And then there's the New Testament interpretation, which takes it a step further. Right. So here's where the transition seems to take place. Before and after Mark 9, uh, before Jesus is like Elijah and Elisha, they perform many miracles. And he did too, obviously. After, more like a prophet, like Moses. <clears throat> uh, and in that sense, Golder says these are the these are the points you tick off that uh, make Jesus a prophet to be considered a prophet at that point. And he again is saying this is the view of the Jerusalem Church. It may not be our view now, but it was the view of the, of the Jerusalem Church <clears throat> or Jerusalem Mission. <clears throat> uh, he scolds the faithless generation that will not believe him, and the word in the the Bible is upbraided, you know, and which means scold. Uh, he overrides Moses' ruling on divorce. He adds to the Ten Commandments and he adds, give all that you have to the poor. And that comes from in Mark. And um, he proclaims the love commandment, which is really from Leviticus originally which says, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now, that's Leviticus. Jesus seems to expand that even more uh, in the sense that he said, he asked the question, he answers the question, who is your neighbor? And the the neighbor seems to be not just uh, among your people, it seems to be all people. Yeah, being called goes the extension. Yeah. Is yeah. Where Jesus has extending ex- the man. Right. right. Okay, for the Jerusalem mission, um, basically Jesus was honored as a prophet promised in Deuteronomy 1815. Now, again, remember we're looking at the Jerusalem mission versus the uh, Paul and his the, the Pauline mission. A new Elisha following the return to Elijah, John of Malachi. So um, the new Elisha is Jesus. Divine Spirit emerged and entered him at baptism, transferred from John. We've talked about that you know, several mm-hmm. times, except we haven't talked about that as being transferred from John. Produced marvelous works and teachings. Why was the cross an embar- embarrassment to the Jerusalem church or the Jerusalem mission? It was usually used for criminals. Okay, used for criminals. But there was also this concept that the spirit cannot die. So if, if Christ dies on the cross, how can he, how can that happen? Because the spirit cannot die. And again, I keep reminding you, we're talking about what Golder says, the Jerusalem mission believed as opposed to the Pauline mission. I have a question. Yes. Um, well, if you take the parallel of Jesus with Elisha, how did Elisha go? I don't really know. You are asking all the tough questions. <laughs> <laughs> Check Wikipedia. That's, that's your assignment for this <laughs> yeah. to find out how Elisha died. <laughs> I know, I'm not curious. I know. What was well, Elijah? Elijah. Okay, Elijah, was Elijah was taken up into heaven right. on the chariot. Elijah, I don't think but I'm not sure. I remember how Elijah died. 
just look at the end of Second Kings or something. Just read it all quickly. <laughs> Skim it for us. He read it. Yeah. So he there, also rose from the dead. He rose from the dead. So, According to Google, Elisha. Elisha did. Yeah. All right. He what? Yeah, Elisha raised the dead without speaking word. He merely laid himself on the dead body twice. And the dead rose up after his dead. Well, is that him? Oh no, that's, that's him that's, raising that's, the dead. That's one of his miracles. That's uh, one of don't trust Google. Yeah. <laughs> you have to read the whole Google. Use the good old. <laughs> so yeah, anyhow, the Jerusalem mission basically said yeah. the spirit can't die. Therefore, Jesus, uh, the spirit must have left Jesus before he died. Okay. So it was their way of trying to combine Jesus, the human being, with uh, the spirit of, yeah. of the Christ. Um, the Again, Golder is saying that they added the first lines of Psalm 22 to show that the spirit of Christ left Jesus. Okay. Who knows the Psalm 22 by heart? I do not. <laughs> Nobody? No. Do you? No. <laughs> <laughs> so here, here's the Dennis, Matthew. Hey, Dennis. It's 2 Kings 13, verses 20 to 21. Which okay. says, Elisha died. <laughs> but not how. <laughs> but yeah, it says, when Elisha died, and they buried him. Okay. <laughs> not as glamorous of a send off <laughs> as his predecessor. <laughs> <laughs> but then it says, and it came to pass that they were burying the man that, behold, they, they spied and abandoned the men, and they cast the man into the sepulchre of Elisha. And when the man was left down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood upon his feet. Oh, okay. So he's touching the bones of Elisha, raised him from the dead. And bones going to raise again. Yeah. Bones and bones and bones. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> <We're> thoroughly <laughs> okay, confused. Okay, class. <laughs> um, so the Matthew, who is a patrine, says, and Jesus, when he had cried out again with a loud voice, released his spirit, released his spirit. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. So that's, that's Matthew. He released, he gave up his spirit. Um, another version says, then Jesus shouted out again, dismissed his spirit and died. So again, this is part of what Golder is claiming says that the spirit left Jesus before he died. So he dismissed his spirit and died. Okay. And yet another version says of, of the same scripture, by the way, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud, loud voice, yielded up the ghost. So we can kind of get see where Golder is drawing this out and saying the Petrines believe that the, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, uh, the, the Christ spirit left before Christ actually died. This is one version of what I command unto you, my spirit. Yes. Yes. I think we're going to get to that in a second. Okay, here's here's a truncated version of Psalm 2, the second, um, except that's 22nd. Excuse the typo. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night. But I find no rest, scorned by everyone, despised by, by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurtle insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rest, rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Dogs surround me, a pack of villains encircle me, encircles me. They pierced uh, my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots from my garments. That's Psalms 22. Anything in there sound familiar? Yep. <laughs> yep. One of the 
one of the things, one of the stories that Joel ends the, the chapter with is uh, two clerics discussing uh, why in Good Friday services that my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? How do you explain that? Um, and one says to the other, well, they would know the end of the thing. It's a very positive ending to Psalm 22. Your God does come and protect them, uh, which is beyond what I've listened to, by the way. <clears throat> uh, and Golder's comment is, how um, do you expect your congregation to know Psalm 22 by heart? Uh, some folks claim that this was a prayer that Jesus was <coughs> offering on the cross, that he was simply reciting Psalm 22 or parts of it because it was, it was a prayer. So uh, take your pick, it's, it's hard to know. But keep in mind that, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And let's look at, um, let's say, I gotta admit somebody. Um, Okay, Jesus' last words. Um, in Luke, who, who was Luke? Was he Pauline or Petri? Okay, he was a great compromiser, okay? So he says, when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Luke doesn't say, my God, my God, why have have you forsaken me? Okay. Here's John. Now there was a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled the sponge with vinegar and put it to his lip, to his mouth. When Jesus had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Where's my God, my God? Where? <laughs> it's not in there either. And John, again, is, is not a patrine, definitely a Pauline. And then finally, we have Mark. Darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, and Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That's how they taught us to say hey, when we were singing. I'm not sure that's pronunciation correct, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. So you see, different interpretations of the last words of Jesus. And what's interesting is we throw them all together. When we have a service and we talk about the last words of Jesus, we throw all those together and they are not duplicated from one gospel to the next, which may or may not be significant. You know, if all of us went and saw a car crash, <clears throat> we'd probably describe something differently. Okay, just like the Christmas story, you know I mean? Yeah. You have to you have to really dig deep to find out that that those words weren't said in every version, yeah, exactly. and then maybe there was a reason why they weren't said in every version. Yeah. That's the part that nobody teaches you as a young Christian. Well, I think because everybody's confused because they're they're different, so they blend them all together. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's, 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 a, it's a better yeah. story. It's a better story for yeah. sure. It's seven, a fuller story. The seven yeah. final words, yeah. you know. I mean, maybe, that's, maybe that it's that much more dramatic, Jane. You're, you're right. right. It's it's I'm with you. Yeah. <laughs> Think about the Christmas story. Yeah. Yeah. You need the king. Yeah, it's not as dramatic, is it? Yeah. Like, <laughs> well, well, and you wonder also, excuse me, uh, you wonder also how much of it is like the game of gossip. And, yes. You know, I've told you this, and you change it a tiny game. bit to tell the next person. Mm -hmm. and so by the time it gets written down, it's it's not saying the exact same thing. Yeah. You preside over one service and have this in, and next year somebody says, I want to add my part in, and yeah. you know, this goes on and on. How many centuries have we been dealing with this? Well, and I, I suspect that the people who assembled the gospels were thinking of their brain in the, in the mouths of two or three witnesses. And again, you get witnesses to any event and you get different points of view. So the contradictions don't necessarily mean <coughs> something subversive going on. It can very well mean people have different views of, of the events that took place. And what was important for the author? Yes, and the way right. exactly, exactly. It's important. And who went ahead and wrote the the you know hand version out 
you yes. know, could have changed a word here and there. Yes. Translation. Yep. So you want to have to rewrite the whole thing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like that. It's sound. Yeah. Okay. So, what's the message of this chapter? Well, the message is in full. Christians seem to be in a lot of services, exploration is still taking place. How does that change? Christians church is quite a It took a while to sort through that, like several centuries. <laughs> yeah, right. exactly. Exactly. <clears throat> Anyone else? I um, I really um, it the way you presented it for me something that I didn't really take away as much in the book as in class was the authority of the mantle, and there was many many parallels of what we discussed in various um, individuals that have this mantle passed on uh, from one disciple to another leader to another. I think we see that even today in our own yeah. congregations and experiences. And it's a very powerful yeah. um, spiritual thing to have a mantle. Well, and we, nice. I mean, we even talk about prophetic mantle. We talk about it as applied right. to from Joseph Smith all the way down to Steve Beast. I mean, it, right. there is there is a pattern that we still believe and follow there. So um, I'm going to just throw up some questions and let you. Uh, address any of them that you want in the two minutes we have. Um, are the parallels between Elijah, John the Baptist, and Elisha, Jesus, important to you? Why does Golder dwell on possessionist Christology? <laughs> like that's easy. Yeah. Right, three, that's the three big or question. four chapters of yes, it, right. Mr. Golder. What did you get out of this chapter? And are you a possessionist <laughs> or a Messiah Christologist? <laughs> So we have uh, two minutes for you to answer all those questions. Yeah. Put that on your OKCupid okay account that you're a possessionist. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, right. Messiah Christologist. <laughs> Anyone want to respond to any of those? I do have to say that I, I need to study more Elijah and Elisha because I didn't realize yeah. the parallels were yeah. that close. That that. I heard, you know, you hear the stories of Elijah and, you know, Elisha takes up his mantle, like you mm -hmm. said, but I never studied the details of it. Yeah. But here we are going, oh my gosh, there, there are more parallels. Yeah. It's more than just driving on I-4 to 435. I'm, uh -huh. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and this would have been something that didn't make sense. That's right. Other comments or answers to any of these questions? Well, I think the reason Boulder spent so much time on it is we need to understand the global situation. And I don't think I would really study that much better. The difference is in the mm -hmm. And so it makes me concerned. And that there was a debate. Right. right. Yeah. There was yeah. Debate. yeah. yeah. For so long, Christians have blended all these stories yes. that it never has occurred to us yeah. that we need to separate them out a little bit. Yeah. Or I've taken the debate that they had thousands of millennia a year ago uh, for granted, right? Yeah. They were going through like the spirit. That was such an important thing of yeah. how the spirit was yeah. parted. And here we are just like, we're good. It's not an issue. <laughs> right. We know how, you know, we know how it ended up. Yeah, it ended up. Like, it's yeah. incredible. I mean, you, it's yeah. a wonderful point. It's a lot yeah. of gratitude to the early Christians. Yeah. yeah. I mean, on many ways. They, right. they dealt with a lot of different controversies. Yes. And, uh, oh, I would say I, I had always just read it with the like that, you know, that you know what's coming and didn't even notice the parts that. You know, were possessionist, or you know, <laughs> of course, he was born of, of Mary, and he was, you know, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, and I'm, I'm always amazed that, um, for me, it answers some questions about the contradictions 
the scriptures. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the historically, when you study the historical background and, and the commentaries and all, it it makes a lot more sense why it's not, you know, A B C D E, you know, and straightforward on all the gospels. So it's and and why the book of John doesn't have the word. That's kind of weird. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's completely skipped the story. Oh, yeah. 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 Exactly. Well, we we would we would jump over them and just kind of go, yeah, that's weird, that's sneaky, let's move on. You know, exactly. and, and now we actually have, you know, more of a reason, yeah, of mm -hmm. of why it was. And and it's I think for educated minds, we wanted, you know, we need that. Yeah, I like. Yeah, I like having an answer. Yeah, me too. Well, like we are we are out of time. I see the bench. Yeah, I'm looking at <laughs> that's a supplement. <laughs> Sharon up there. <laughs> now, next week that's we go good. on to chapter 19, I believe it is, and we talk about the incarnation. Uh, and my sincere apologies, but. You have to deal with me again. I'm teaching next Sunday, so. Apology oh, oh. <laughs> accepted. I was thinking, oh, for you. Yeah, sad for you, not for us. <laughs> Two Thank weeks you for all your work. Sure. Thank you. Wonderful. Good job, yeah. yeah.